You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 69, Scanners Suck. This week on The Dental Guys, Brad, the dental lab guy, joins us to discuss why scanners suck, or do they? Yeah, people are always asking us, hey, dental guys, should I buy a scanner? What kind of scanner should I buy? What brand is the best? What's the one that's going to make me the most money? Are these things the best thing ever? I saw this stuff on John, Facebook. John, stop right there. We should just stick with reversible hydrocolloid. Let's just go back there. This week on The Dental Guys. This episode of The Dental Guys is brought to you by the Dental Crafters Network, your implant restorative connection. From surgical planning to patient-specific guides, quality implants, and final restorations, the Dental Crafters Network provides one relationship with infinite possibilities. Call 1-800-472-8302 today. That's 1-800-472-8302. And by Restorative Driven Implants. Understand, place, restore, and implement dental implant treatment from John and Wes. The Dental Guys. Go to restorativedrivenimplants.com right now to sign up for the next series of courses and take your implant education to the next level. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm John The Dental Guy. And I'm Wes The Dental Guy. And here we are with Brad, The Dental Lab Guy. Welcome, Brad. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. Oh man, it's been a while. It's been too long. Wes. People have been, been asking. People oh, have been asking, "Where is Brad?" The dental. They lab actually guy? have. They're like, that we would really we like to have another episode with Brad. We're starting to like. Okay, well, maybe we should just maybe. have. Maybe Brad needs his own show. <laughs> yeah, we learn we, a lot. <laughs> Brad, we just you unthawed. Start your own podcast. <laughs> yeah, that'd be it. We. I was in an ice cube. We just unthawed here, so I, you know, that's, I was. I was frozen. That's why I wasn't on. So. <laughs> man, man, it's I mean, brutal. Well, you know, I just. I, I just have to let the the listeners and viewers in on the fact that we're about to do what we've never done before, which <laughs> is to record two episodes back to back. I mean, you know, I was thinking at first maybe we should not say that and make it look like, you know, we just wore the same clothes, you know, two weeks yeah, in we a row. Yeah, we got to say it. <laughs> we just got to say it. Look, no, we're about to go hardcore for the next... Two you know, for two. <laughs> two, three hours worth of... I mean, so we have... <clears throat> that just shows how much life, how much of a life we really have, you know, is that we just hang out, talk about dentistry for two, two and a half well, hours. We've always tried to record in advance, and, and this is part of the, the summer push for us to try to get content yeah. out for you guys. Uh, well, and plus, big, when we can get Brad, I mean, we got to, if we can well, get him, we so better get him for as long as possible. He's so busy, you know, <laughs> he's so busy and so important. <laughs> I mean, I, right. can't, I can't even call and talk to the guy anymore. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I know it's like, oh yeah, Brad. Let me let me give you his concierge. Just kidding. I'll be with you soon. <laughs> yeah, listen Just to kidding. you guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, but we're glad to have you on, Brad, because today's show is really one that we think you are going to be able to have a very unique perspective on, because today's show is all about scanners. And Wes, and Wes, we've been talking about having a show on scanning for. A long we'll to, time. We've kind of alluded to it in the show. We've never done it till we've now. Never, we've never done it till now. We've alluded to digital optical scanning um, in the past. Um, and some of you might have picked up on that we know a little bit about it. And uh, what, we, what we thought we would do is produce a show for you that is current, modern, and um, gives you some idea of what maybe you should be looking at if you're interested in um, optical scanning. At the end of this episode, we will make some uh, recommendations uh, based on the current state in digital optical scanning. Yeah, so yeah, stay yeah, tuned yeah, for yeah, that. yeah. That's all fine. But you know what, Wes? Come on. <laughs> the current state of scanning well, is that's pretty... Right. It's not that it's not what I mean. Should you even consider buying a scanner? I don't know, well, man. I mean, well, let's, let's just interesting. Yeah, right? I mean, wait till the end of the episode. Yes, we will give our give you our thoughts. <clears throat> will okay? we say yes or will we say no? Right. You know? That's what I'm saying. Is like, is it worth even considering it? I don't even know because I mean, let's talk about the technology here. We saw we saw the technology come on pretty strong, and I'm not talking about. Sarek. Okay, let's go ahead and just say, <clears throat> beginning of the show here, we're not really talking about Sarek in the show. We're not talking about CAD CAM. We're just talking about, you know, digital intraoral scanning 
mainly for whatever use you have for it, whether it be mainly, you know, we're talking about sending exporting to the lab, or we're talking about if you want to use it for your own internal reasons, but we're talking about the systems that are set up for scanning. This really became big in, in the early to mid 2000s. It, it's not new technology, but the question, and really maybe this is a question for Brad, uh, I, I think, because Brad's seen a lot of scanners. He's seen a lot of scanners that have come and gone, a lot of new scanners. Um, Brad, what do you think as far as the technology is, have we kind of reached like a plateau in the technology where it's not progressing uh, as fast as maybe it did? Or do you feel like that is, it's still kind of progressing at a relatively quick rate? What do you think on that? Yeah, I actually think the technology kind of has plateaued a little bit. You know, when it first came out, there, you know, we had some powder versions. Um, there was a little bit of a change up and going to more powderless. Uh, there were some features within the software that came out where, you know, the ve developments could show the amount of reduction on a prep. Um, it could show if the walls are undercut, you know. Um, <clears throat> so that was a little small, little nuance advancements in the software. But I kind of feel like it has plateaued out. I haven't seen really any more really neat advancements on you know, ease of use um, mm -hmm. or, you know, or software platform change that's really enhanced it greatly. So I do agree. It's how long have you been, how long have you been working with scans in the lab sent, sent from out, from the outside? You know, not, not in, not lab scanning, but, but dentist scanning. Right. You know, we started uh, kind of when 3M's TrueDef first kind of hit um, is when we started to jump in. Uh, we were not, uh, we're not a CERIC laboratory uh, initially. We are a CERIC lab now. Um, but weren't but, you but, with, we were with COS, let's clarify. What, you were that, with Chairside Oral Scanners. I'm sorry, that's what was, I meant to say, yeah, Wes. Thank you. Yeah. What Chairside Oral Scanner okay. from 3M originally came the OG, out. The OG, the OG scanner. The Correct. OG. <laughs> that's when we the first tennis, got involved. They call it the tennis ball. Uh, or the <laughs> tennis racket handle. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So, we, so you got started. So that would have been what, like when? 2000 2008, what? 2009, yeah. right? Yeah, I think it's okay. about, about that timeline. That's when we started so jumping years. in real heavy. Ten so years. since that time, what's changed? Let's kind of go through that. You've gone, some systems have gone powderless. Correct. Some systems have gone color. Color. That was an advancement. Um, and you've you've seen some speed advances. Yep, faster scanning, um, a little bit more depth control. Originally, it was kind of fixed dimension, and now they got a wider range where you can almost touch the tooth up to like 15 millimeters away. You know, the, so the okay. range of motion has changed for sure. Some of the yep. wands too. The wands have gotten smaller. I've the, noticed. Like, the wand, wands have gotten smaller. You know, 3M originally kind of came out with a smaller wand. Now, dental wings. They have an interesting wand where it's actually a half moon shaped. Um, it's really, really thin. Um, some of the scanning technology has changed of how they're scanning and what they use. Um, you know, some the theory behind powder was that's where the camera would get its pattern back from was powder. Now, some of the cam cameras, such as dental wings, they actually shoot their pattern right out of the the camera, shoots a pattern onto the tooth itself you know so, so kind of like the iphone face id idea yeah. is like there's like this dot matrix thing correct. That you, it's infrared technology correct so that you know yeah, some you of know, those but, advanced you know, here's my thoughts on this here's why it's plateaued and here's why mm. it's not going to change probably oh. for five to ten years okay i'm just going to say it is Man. that the market penetration go. the market penetration is only 10 percent. now when was that now, taken in 2017 pause. 10%? 10 percent 10 percent in 2017 that's, that's from the american dental association in jada if you remember back in the fall john Man. we talked about impressions yeah. and we talked about yeah. how many people are sending impressions to the lab and they looked at and said well how many people are seeing impressions versus how many people are sending stl data files and the files really are only 10 percent why would a company like 3M um, invest in Bronte's group out of MIT back in the day, Brad, that had the COS, the chairside oral scanner, put hedge all of their, their whole division into digital and kind of slowly say, hey, look, well, they didn't slowly. They just said, we're going to stop innovating on impression material and you had kind of firsthand knowledge of them saying, we're going to stop. 
And just recently, they re-released, what was it, Imprint uh, 4 came Four. out. 4, yeah. yeah and, which has some now. pretty amazing stuff. But that was their first impression material innovation in over, what, what would you say, t- Brad? A long time. It's, it was a long hedged, time. Yep. They I hedged think... all their bets into digital. What happened was is that, my theory is, is that market penetration is just not there. I Your think, thoughts? you know, if you don't have revenue coming in, gentlemen, it doesn't <clears throat> uh, pay for the engineers to keep developing. You know, and yeah. your, your 10% stands true in all the lab forums that I'm part of. Uh, Cal Lab down in Chicago midwinter confirm those same numbers you're talking, Wes. And interestingly enough, before this show, um, I wanted to get numbers to see where we were at. And nine months ago, we were at 7%. And today we're at 10%. So in nine wow. months, we had a 3% hike. So we did see kind of an insurgent here recently. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think part of that's due to economy, doctors needing to spend some money, things are going well. Um, but still, we're, we are right at 10% today. So you're and right I think at that the that's, average. Yeah, right at and the I average. think that that just tells us that, you know, kind of all we need to know that the reason why maybe the technology's plateaued, as Wes said, is because there's not enough money uh, that's pushing these industries forward. So, oh, but John, but John, about, before we yeah. go to the next thing, because it is a yeah. perfect segue, but yes, I have yes. to stop and digress just slightly, is because if Facebook is the new peer reviewed journal, <laughs> the super cool kids, the super cool kids are scanning. And right. what you see on YouTube and Facebook is what I can do with scanners. And right. what is possible with what I'm doing today in my dental practice. And right. I think we have to be very careful what we see because what we see is not reality. Brad, exactly what you see in your lab is reality. Right. And because you're seeing it day in and day out on a global scale. Right. And whenever we come to the Wes Mullins and the John Rogers practice and whoever's listening to this show's practice, your world is very finite. But Brad's yeah. world, and one of the reasons why he's on the show tonight, is his world is global. And so when you right. have a global vision of what scanning is doing uh, for the industry, that's why we want to bring Brad on and talk about what is possible today. And we kind of broke this down, John, into two segments. What is predictable 100% of the time with the current optical scanners on the market? John, I'll let you take it from here. Yeah, that, that's the first thing. That, and, and this is, as Wes said, I mean, Brad is the no BS guy here guy, because, because Brad actually has to make a living. His lab has to produce dentistry that works and fits. And the dentists that send their work to Brad, uh, they need to get a crown back. So they're not dinking around with something that doesn't work. And Brad's not dinking around with something that doesn't work. He has to have something that works. So this is the reality. This is a real dental lab that knows digital. So let's ask the question, what is predictable 100% of the time? So we feel like, and Brad, I want to know your thoughts on this. We feel like with just about all the scanners on the market, that one of the most predictable things is quadrant dentistry. In other words, crown and bridge, one, two, three units done uh, on a quadrant basis, which is a bread and butter part of dentistry, the posterior single unit crown, one or two crowns, we feel that's pretty darn predictable. Would you agree with that? Extremely predictable. Yep, totally agree. Okay. okay. And we feel, I actually would make the statement that that maybe occlusion is even more predictable than what you can get with impressions for those single or maybe one to two units, just because you're getting a true true, true indication with no material between the teeth. Do you feel like that's the case, Brad, that you're maybe getting some advantages there? Absolutely. One of the biggest problems with triple trays is is you're throwing something between the teeth, like you said. Even when you take a bite registration with polyvinyl siloxine, there's still something between the teeth. And they bite down quite often. We're seeing a shifting or a movement or a protrusive movement. That's hard for the doctor to see it. But when you're dealing with oral scanning, it's tooth-to-tooth contact. The patients feel where they normally bite, and visually that doctor or the assistant can actually see where they bite into. So it gives us much more predictability on a bite, for sure. And one of the guys I heard, uh, Peter Barnt, who I really need to get you guys in front of him, you'd really like him, but he talked about how when you have somebody go into a bite for scanning, and you can have them clench, and you can see that that PDL compresses... I do it a every certain time. amount. 
a certain amount and that 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 you know 30 40 microns 50 microns of pdl compression when they go into a clench you just can't get that with a triple tray no. or with the bite registration material and that's can be the difference there between you know perfect occlusion and an occlusion that always needs to touch even when you did everything right with your bite registration so moving on from that we can i think put that one to bed you can do quadrant dentistry very very effectively with excellent repeatability so brad what would you say some of the other you know we have a little list here but i want you to maybe go through the list that we made rather than me just reading it and just saying you know what are some of the other non-critical types of uh, things that, or, or critical things that you feel are 100% predictable when it comes to scanning? You know, I go right to the surgical guides. Um, it, it's very predictable to scan for surgical guides. Now, you are scanning full arch to do that, so it's more complex on the doctor's side. Um, so it does take a little bit technique on your side to be able to scan a full arch. But as far as the end result for predictability, the guides fit extremely, extremely well when you do scanning. Okay. You know, Would so you say the same for like a full arch splint, like a night guard type yes, of appliance? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Same thing. You know, very predictable, uh, fit well. Um, the single or the little bit more, a little bit more challenging, maybe to get a bite registration <clears throat> for like a you know if you're trying to do like an open construction bite type of bite, you know, you, you've got a little bit more challenge there to get that correct with your, with a full arch. Correct. Yep. You got, you know, a couple points of scanning to capture bite. And again, that's, it's, that's on the user side for sure. But when you're talking about the end result predictability of the scanning technology, mm -hmm. the product fits well, you know, as long as the yeah. data come in is it, coming in is correct. Yeah. And I think that those are, you know, a hundred percent of the time going to work though. I mean, you, if you, if you do, if you know how to take a full arch scan, these things are going to work. And also Invisalign, you know, we, we know Invisalign is a partner with a lot of these companies, although currently, uh, you know, iTero and Invisalign, I think are like in a, you know, like it's, it's ridiculous. Like some of these connections where like Invisalign wants to turn off. Oh, well, if you guys don't pay us $10 million, we'll shut off your access to be able to send scans. I mean, it's, I don't even get into that rabbit hole, but you know, it, it, a scanner, I think, can produce excellent fit with aligner therapy. So, I mean, Brad, is there anything we're missing that you would say is 100% of the time going to work? I mean, are there, any, are there other things? Because we started to go through some things that we felt were maybe going to work, but those are the things we felt really comfortable saying work about all the time. You know, we have pretty good success with implants with it. I wouldn't get heavy into multiple implants, but the single unit implants, pretty predictable. Um, I would say okay. in the lab side, we probably have a few more contact issues, maybe a little tighter contacts on implants um, than we do with a crown and bridge scan. Um, yeah. But occlusion and, and then general, you know, overall they work pretty successful. Um, but we, since you brought now, since you brought that up, I just want to talk just a moment about that, okay? Because since you brought up single implants, great, great point. Um, I want to talk about, okay, though you're right, but let's talk about some of the things that can go wrong with that, okay? Because you, with a single implant, you're talking about a scan body, Correct. right? You got to put onto the implant. Um, what? How do you deal with the fact that number one, you can't see subgingival as much with that, okay? And then number two, what what about in a case like, say, a premolar, isn't it sometimes difficult for the scanner to see the proximal contact? And how do you deal with that? I want to back way up and start even further back, John. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> okay. I want to clear something up right away that's a huge confusion for us on a daily basis. So let's talk about the scan body, first of all. Yeah. Because you can't just order online, you know, off eBay and order a scan body for that implant and scan it and send it to the laboratory, okay? If any of you out there wanna get into this and use a scanner for scanning an implant with a scan body, you have to call your laboratory first. Call your lab, tell them what you wanna do, and make sure that they have the right architecture within their engineering so they can accept a file of a certain scan body, okay? That's, that's number one, and we get scans all the time daily of a random scan body that they bought from somebody for that implant, and it comes to our lab, well, we can't do anything with it because we have to have those same CAD files in our workflow, okay? I was blown away when I learned this. Again, the same guy, Barnt, he showed this workflow tree 
the same implant, three scan bodies made for this implant. And there were like red X's up here on these three things you couldn't do. But down here you could do those. But yeah. this third one, you could do the first one and the last one, but not the middle three. What yes. in the world, man? <laughs> It's, it's, you know, it depends on the lab and what scan body you end up, you know, working with. So, yeah. Know, so that that's number one. Crazy. So just anybody, just remember, you go in it, call your lab first. Don't just buy a scan body. Call your lab, whoever you're using, and make sure you work with them on the proper scan body so they get the right information. That's just rule number one. Okay. Then you talked about making sure the scan body is seated. Yeah, you have to screw it in just like an impression for an implant. You have to screw the open or closed tray impression in. The first thing you need to do is take an x-ray. At least you should be taking an x-ray with every single implant you do to make sure that the, that the impression coping seated properly into the implant. The same thing stands true with the scan body. You have to put it in. You hand tighten it in. You have to take a PA you have to uh, or a bite wing and make sure that it's seated correctly on top of that implant. And then yep. you, and, and you need to know what to look for. OK, because every scan body might have something different to identify if it's seated or if it's not seated. OK, so I that- just have to take a quick a quick segue for a moment. Brad has a thing, a thing you think you're going to go a on this. Thing, aren't you? I'm going to go on it. Do you want me okay. to rant about this for a while? You know, I love this it. Is, <laughs> this is you know, this is interesting to me because I've known Brad a lot longer than John has. Yeah. But this discovery process, I'm watching, you know, John, as he's probably quizzed Brad behind the scenes <laughs> like I did years ago in the car or wherever it was. And it's just interesting to see, John, you just see the knowledge that Brad <laughs> Yes. Well, I because just, he I, always pulls out the thing. The first thing that Brad pulled out on me years ago, I digress, was the Enstrom machine. And I'm like, oh, I love it. whatever. I, I was like, what? You, you, you won't test stuff? I'm like, I've never been associated with somebody like this. So, I mean, like, this is why we bring Brad but, the dental lab guy. I know. know. Guys, you got to test for thing. success. You know, if you don't but test, has you don't have success. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> hold on. But Brad, but Brad, Some but Brad has a thing. He has a thing about things not being seated oh. on the radiograph. That's what our uh, that's what I'm times, talking about. How many the times? The first thing he says when we ask him. So here we are having a scanning conversation, okay? I asked Brad a simple <laughs> scanning question. I'm like, so how do you deal with the scan on the scan body? He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Let me just tell you the number one thing is you got to seat it down and you got to get a radiograph and it's got to be a bite wing and it's got to be freaking parallel and it better know what you're looking for and it's different with every implant system and you better know what the heck you're doing I because know, we wait, get screwed every day I, I would never see that kind maybe he knew that kind of intensity no no he's never no he has never said it that way but i mean brad this is obviously a significant issue it's before it is. you even talk about the scanning i just think it's hilarious because i know it's like every day for you you're like it's a detailed you, thing that though, well we want the doctor is to be successful, you know. So, yeah, and sure, for the doctor sure. to be successful and not have to have a patient reappointed, it's all about the detail, you know. You got to oh, yeah, you got to start somewhere. So, yeah, I always start with a little. And honestly, it's sometimes we forget about the little things, you know. We're yeah, talking about right. getting a school a cool optical scanner and a scan body, and I can it do happens. this and I can do that. You forget about the simple, you know. I'll say kindergarten little principles, and that's just when you screw yep. it, make sure it's down. Otherwise, it's a failure. You know, well, I'll tell it's you, a great point. It's a what great this point. means is for you that are out there interested in scanning, we just talked about a bunch of things here uh, that were 100% predictable. Um, you know, most of the time we're just like, this is brain. You could do this stuff. It's, it's like not, not hard. But what you just heard here is a little, hey, it's not hard, but you better read the instructions right. and you Read better call like anytime you start scanning the first thing i'm going to tell you to do before you even buy your scanner is call your lab you're working with you know if yeah. you're wanting to do crown and bridge call your call your lab call your lab and yeah. say hey i'm going to start doing crown and bridge what kind of files can you accept so but assuming that you get your impression coping seated assuming you've got that all solid um, how do you deal with those, those, you say the scan body is in the way of the scanner seeing the proximal contact. Um, there's a little bit more to that, right? That you got to do. There is. And you know, every scanner is going to be different. So if you get trained in on it and you want to do this workflow, make sure you talk to the trainer to understand how to do to work the, the workflow. So generally you scan the tissue and you scan interproximal contacts first with the scan body out. Then you insert the scan body, 
go ahead and take your bite wing to make sure it's seated. And then, <laughs> then you go ahead and scan it. And don't get so caught up in scanning the, 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 the long shaft that goes down into the implant. What you really want to concentrate on scanning is just the artifact on top of the scan body. Uh, quite yeah, like often it'll be a orientation piece or whatever. Exactly. That you know, it'll is. be like a trilobe or it'll be something that'll be at the very top of the scan body. That you want to capture all sides of because that's what we end up orienting with. We don't really care about that long shaft that goes down. We just care about the top part. So. Yeah. That would be so let's take that same idea, because let's roll with that, into the next section of what we consider to be living on the edge, <laughs> because this is where we're going to get into some things that are less predictable uh, with intraoral scanning. And let's just maybe hang on implants for a second, since we're right there. Yeah, go, so go right down on that list there. Yeah, mm -hmm. you mentioned, Brad, multiple units. So... What about two implants in one quadrant, for instance? Or let's go from that up to maybe full arch. You can tell us what the limitations are, in your opinion, for scanning with implants. You know, two implants in one quadrant is just fine. We have found, the as you start to work your way around the arch, um, we start to lose, um, <clears throat> how do you call it, stability, accuracy. Um, so... It, we're a little cautious. We are not scanning full arch all on six cases right now with scan bodies. Uh, the tests that we've done is it, there's not inner or uh, cross arch stability in any of the units that we feel are predictable enough to do a zirconia hybrid, you know, type case gotcha. on. Um, just haven't felt comfortable. I know there's labs out there doing it, pushing a limit. We're not the guy who, you know, we're testing limits all the time internally. That's why we have instrument machines. That's why we do a ton of internal testing, but I don't do it as a reproducible product to doctors because I just don't feel like it gives them what that well, patient needs. Well, I'll just kind of back that up. If you go to JPD and, mm -hmm. um, and look up some research regarding cross-arch precision with scanning, I'm sorry, I don't care what kind of scanner you have. It's just not there. Um, it's not good enough. It's not, not good yet. enough. It's not good enough yet for cross-arch precision, uh, meaning you can't repeatedly scan somebody from left to right and it be accurate enough for to mill a bar or to right. do some type of zirconium hybrid or whatever you're doing, splinted and, restorations. And I, and I just want to reemphasize that we'll say that and there'll inevitably be some dude. Oh, bring it. Who oh, yeah. will bring put it. up, uh, well, well, no, but he'll, they'll put up a case. Right, okay? that's what I'm saying. Like, that's the super I cool kid, John. did this case and we saw... Herman Gallucci, we were all there at the Digital Dentistry Conference a couple yep. of years ago. Harvard did a you were there, proof of concept right? that you can do proof a full arch concept. scan of implants. But that is does not mean Brad is living in the real world that he knows that you can't do that predictably. I mean, was that is a fair statement, Brad? It's a fair statement, it, and it depends what you guys want to do. Now, if I want to loosen my tolerances up on my milling machines when I make that bar, whoa, what, it, it, whoa, it, what does that mean? It, whoa, whoa, what does that mean? Loosen tolerances? Uh, make things fit sloppy. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> See, if you oh, want to make so things fit up. sloppy, so you're making what? up for now, so yeah, the inaccuracy. We, we, we could, you know, anybody can do it. And then, you know, in these lab forums I'm on too, you always have that too. Well, I can do this and I can do that. And anything can be done, gentlemen. It just anything. depends on how well you want <laughs> it to be that. done. You know, <laughs> how far do you want to push it? How accurate do you want it to feel? How good do you want it to fit? All you know, right. that's so what it comes it's down not to. predictable. This, this whole not idea predictable. of splinter restorations. So that's living on the edge. Living on the edge. Folks. Living Absolutely. on the edge, John, uh, Brad. Go to the next thing. Go to the next thing on yeah. the list here. Yeah, go back up to that number one there on the list, yeah. if you would, Brad. I want you to talk through that. Uh, interior aesthetic crowns. Yeah, veneers, Bridges, that type of thing. Veneers. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing about scanning is when you start coming in from the posterior and you roll into the anterior, there is it's it's a technique. Okay, it's a, it's it's a technique because you got to scan facial, you got to scan the incisal, you got to scan the lingual it again becomes more technique sensitive. Um, you know, a few early on when we did some veneer cases, we found that the veneers weren't fitting very well, that actually the mm. impressions were more accurate than the scanning was. Now, I think we've kind of worked through some of that. It's gotten better, I think, basically because the technique of the scanner has gotten better. You know, the person behind it's gotten a little bit better, but I'm not sure it's 100% predictable. Yeah, you know. I'm not there because, you know, when we're when we're trying to prep, you know, veneers and Brad, you know, we try to set these cases up right with ortho a lot of times to minimize 
our preparation a lot of times in teeth that are colored nicely to three tenths at the gingival third, yeah. transitioning up to that one millimeter cutback to two millimeter cutback at the incisal edge. A scanner seeing three tenths, that's 300 microns. Yeah, I can see it, but can you reproduce a pressed ceramic on that? I mean, mill it and all that and really do it precise across six to eight teeth? I mean, that's what you're asking this technology to do. Is that why it's unpredictable? I, I think so. You know, you start looking at the, in, everything's got its accuracy or inaccuracies, you know, so there's inaccuracies in the scanner itself, and then there's inaccuracies in the model that you produce, and then there's inaccuracies in any milling machine <clears throat> that you, you mill a product out with or, or press to, and it's the combination or the addition of all of those inaccuracies that end up with something that may not fit so well, you know? And you know, the other thing that you've mentioned to me before <clears throat> is just the detail of the contralateral tooth. So say you're doing a yeah. veneer on number seven yeah. and you want it to look exactly like number 10, texture wise, you know, line angles. And then you look at a printed model or even a milled model, but especially printed model and you see all the layers of printing. And I feel like it's pretty tough for a technician, even a really good one to get a, a exact feel for the texture on that. Not hey, tough, John, it's just, impossible. Just, just stay yeah. right there because the next episode Mm, we're going to talk oh, about that printing technology. We may be talking about we that. We may be talking about that. <laughs> yeah. All right. But it's so impossible. Okay. It's impossible. All right, so, so let's move on to the next thing there, the full arch crown and bridge, like the full mouth rehab, Brad, 2 to 15. Let's get her done. Let's do it <laughs> yeah. with scanners. Are we scanning I, that? I think, are we scanning uh, it? I, you know, Come on. Have I done a few of those yet? I've, I've done a few of those because doctors are willing to push the limit, okay? Uh -huh. um, but we just talked about... Uh, cross arch stability. So it doesn't really matter if it's an implant or it's crown or bridge, but when you start scanning, or scanning all the way across the arch and that span across it, we've found that things aren't as accurate as we'd like to see them. Again, can we make it work? Have I done them? Yeah, we've done them. You know, um, some do of them. You set your milling, do you set your milling strategy different well, in cases like that? Me do you have to loosen it up? Me, no, I haven't. But that's also where I found out that we've had problems because I don't change it because I want it to be just as accurate and fit just as well. But then when you send the product to the doctor and he's like, wow, it didn't, it kind of didn't fit as good as, you know, it normally does. That's what we found with cross arch full mouse is because there's inaccuracies there. Um, so in order to make it work, you would have to kind of open up those tolerances a little bit, create more die spacer, you know, for things to actually go in the mouth doesn't make you it right. You know what right. I'm hearing? You know, living on the edge. The edge. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> go on to but the it next. can work. It's yeah, just it living can. on the edge. It's, it's, it's living on the edge. It go ahead. depends, go depends the what you thing. want to do, you know. Okay, so what about partials? Let's talk about tooth born partials. No tissue support, tooth supported. Do you think that scanning is good enough? for tooth-supported RPD frameworks to be made from it. You know, we've been doing more and more of these. I still don't recommend it on a, you know, regular basis to the doctors. I still recommend an impression for it. But the doctors who do have it are using it for the gag reflex patient that just can't tolerate an impression. So we've been doing more and more of them just for those types of patients, which is a great service. We've been finding they fit pretty good. But remember, with a, a partial, you do have a little bit of that, again, tolerance. You know, you get a, 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 a flexible clasp mm -hmm. that can kind of flex into place. Um, so we've been using it for regular metal RPDs and flexible RPDs. Um, again, if anybody... Saw on our website, we don't advertise to do it. I usually get the call, hey, I need this. Can I do this? The patient can't tolerate it, and we've been able to do it, but not a, a mainstream type suggestion. Now, when you get off of that and you start talking about tissue support, what about Kennedy Class 1s, Kennedy Class 2s? You know, do you start getting nervous when you start talking about tissue and tooth support? Yeah, tissue I don't recommend at all because tissue's mobile, you know. It's it's a yeah. movable anybody movable deal, that so. says they can scan for like border molding. No oh, man. No. Yeah. No. No man. No way. Would you agree, Brad? Oh, it's a hundred percent. You know, the we're into the digital denture world right now. You know, the labs are fast paced. But what does that you know, mean? What does that mean? Digital dentures, yeah. You know, I think digital dentures is more lab digital. Don't go too far down the road. I, I won't. <laughs> but it's more lab digital when I talk so digital. So basically you're scanning my 
master cast, which that you, has border molded yes. uh, l- and land areas. It's yes. got all the classic marks of a good border molded impression. You guys, the dentists, are going to handle dentures as a conventional denture technique that you always had. So, you know, the base plate, bite rim, uh, good impressions and then we scan those <laughs> and then we digitally manufacture it now there's you know we were just at a digital symposium there are people out there saying i can take a three-shaped trias and i can scan and go digital you know prove it guys i haven't seen it how can you take you know and move soft tissue and you you got to open the mouth and pull the lip to get the scan and all that border mold all that's going to be moving you know how do right, you capture right. that i you know Maybe it's coming someday. I'm not sure how, but I don't see it today. We aren't going to practice yeah. it. So well, so again, it's not. It's on it's the not, edge. It's on the edge. It's on the edge. And and again, don't. So if you're listening to this, and I think like all these things we've just listed, they're the outer limits. They're the things that they're cool. These are all cool like ideas, and people are trying to push the limit on them. <clears throat> and you know what? There may be some people out there who have perfected their own workflow by setting. These are the people typically that are in research. They've got their own mill. They've got their own impression scanner. They've got their own testing equipment. Heck, they've got their own software programmer, my goodness. Like some of these guys set behind coding. They're coding uh, all these softwares. You know, Brad, you talk to the coders, and it's like, can I do this? And they code it for you on the fly, and you're doing it that day. Now, that's the kind of stuff we're talking about. And when you start pushing the limits... You start getting unpredictable in most situations, and we're trying to remain predictable as dentists, and Mm -hmm. uh, this is what we don't want to do is we don't want to teach you guys something that is, hey, you could do it once and, yeah, every now and then, and that's just So I I think it's interesting to, to just say, too, that, you know, that's not a lot of stuff that's predictable. I mean, I'm not saying that it's nothing, but, I mean, that's only, like, we listed four things. Quadrant crown and bridge, single posterior implant crowns, non-critical full arch appliances like your splints, your surgical guides, and Invisalign. But, John, there's some cool stuff that is very predictable. Some really okay. cool stuff that you and I have talked about and that I've talked about with uh, some of Brad's people, too. And the first thing that we hear a lot about and how this could, could become more mainstream the faster that scanning gets or the easier that scanning gets is the documentation of the patient's current dentition. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine being able to have the time and the ability to document the current dentition? Now, you're not going to be able to do that now because it just takes too long. But if you had a patient that you said, I want to document the current state in 3D of the current dentition, whether it's your document attrition or erosion or whatever, tooth position, right. you can do that right now and it's predictable. The second thing, I won't spend too much time on this either, is the documentation of the hybrid prosthetic. Now, we first thought about this whenever we were we do a lot of bar wrapped in acrylic. And bar wrapped in acrylic is meant to wear, has a wear point. And so imagine that you're getting ready to deliver your bar wrapped in acrylic to a patient. And before you deliver it, you have it setting on a master model, okay? So one way to to document the current state of that prosthetic is to actually scan that prosthetic on the master model. Now, what does that do for you? Well, you're scanning the model, which is now indexed to the position of the teeth, and now what that sets you up for is the documentation for the lab that if you had to retread the tires or put new base and new teeth, you can set it back to the vertical that you delivered at on day one. So at seven years when you're rebasing and reprocessing teeth, you say, hey, I've got an STL file, and the lab can print that and create a matrix for that master model. So that's yeah. one other way. John, Super tell us cool. about the next thing. Yeah, I think that uh, one of the things I have used or seen used uh, with scanning is when you have a patient who is in orthodontics, now we do a lot, especially... In the last few years, Wes, I mean, how many patients have we put in adult ortho? It's kind of cool. It's pretty funny to look back and think. Thank like, you, uh, how- <laughs> Cheryl DeWood and Gary. And That's all. right. Thanks yeah. to Spear Education for yeah. showing us really what it took to talk to patients about um, orthodontics and, and the importance in their treatment. But when you have a patient in ortho and you're doing a combination orthodontic restorative treatment, 
uh, before, it was such a nightmare to take them in and out of uh, bra brackets and wires. And you really could never get a good impression with brackets. You'd always drag in the impression uh, or else you'd have to use something crappy like alginate. And so now you want to get that patient uh, uh, a restoration made for uh, right when they come out of ortho. Or say you want to make a matrix to add in size a length to teeth you've intruded. You can scan the patient while in ortho and then you can have that uh, ready, and you don't have as long as you don't have anything that's on the facial of the of the tooth, obviously, uh, that you have to take the bracket off for. You can leave them in brackets, and that's a pretty amazing thing that really does maybe change your day to day. Now you you can say, well, gosh, how many of those do I do a year? It depends on how much you do of this, but it is a it is definitely an application. There's something you could not do really without a scanner uh, unless you want to take them really in and out cool of bra stuff, braces. And there's a lot to really go from here. Um, and guys, I just want to move on just a little bit. But before mm -hmm, we do, mm -hmm. I want to talk about the Dental Crafters Network because they're a lab that understands what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. From, I mean, even from a standpoint, we talked about one of the most predictable things you can do is these non-critical foil arch appliances, John. And right. I tell you what, one thing that's changed my practice is scanning for surgical guides versus actually taking an impression because I get the STL data that day, like literally 30 minutes later. And if, and if I have software that I want to do the merger, or if not, my team uploads the CT scan and the STL file that day to the Dental Crafters Network, which has the company Implant Solutions behind it, and they're giving us a quality surgical plan for an implant that's ordered in a particular site. And, and the turnaround time is ridiculous. John, I know you've experienced yeah. some of this recently because you've been sending me some pictures of some of these precision-guided surgeries you've been doing um, as a part of the Dental Crafters Network. And uh, tell us a little bit about that and your experience. Yeah, I think, you know, when you start talking about, um, you know, as we've been talking about just today on the show, you start talking about calling your lab and saying, here's what I want to do, and then they can actually do it, yeah. you know, and that's that's the thing that I've experienced when you talk about a complex case, like, like you know, a case that I did just a couple weeks ago where a patient were, has 7 through 10, they're crowded. They're hopeless. Uh, we're going to lose a we're going to lose a tooth at a time. Uh, so we're going to start planning implants. You know. So we've got. I'm calling them up, going. You know. How far can we? What all can we do here? I'm getting. You know. Impressions. CTs. They're they're doing virtual planning for where the teeth need to go. Then we're planning where the implant needs to go. Then we're planning a custom tissue former. And then, uh, and all, then we're all behind so, and, the scenes, this is happening. And right, and then there's you don't a shell to, temp. That, yeah, yeah, there's a shell temp that's made off of the same, uh, the same thing. So I get all this stuff in a nice little box. I mean, it's amazing. This box comes. It says Implant Solutions. It's got the implant. It's got the guide. It's got the custom tissue former. It's got the shell temp. It's got uh, a little instruction sheet. Uh, and you know, if you're really nice, maybe you even get like a little smiley face sticker. You know, I mean, it's like everything in there to make this case go smoothly. And let me just tell you, it does. So when you call them. Uh, and you should. You should call them and check them out. You know, if you're looking to explore uh, whatever whatever it might be, implant surgical guides, just good old straight up crown and bridge. Give these give give the dental crafters hey, listen, a call yeah. and and ask them. Hey, can I do that? What can you guys do for me? Well, just I think give them one a of the things to see some it. of you guys are new graduates. Some of you have been in the, for whatever amount of time five, ten, fifteen, twenty years. But if you're looking for the a place where you can go and talk about things and really people know what you're talking about, or even right. if you're just wanting to learn more, I, I say look no further than the Dental Crafters Network. Yeah, 1-800-472-8302. That's 1-800-472-8302 or dentalcrafters.net. Check them out. We do not think that you'll be disappointed and tell them the dental guys sent you because that really helps us out. So let's go back, dive right back into this because it's been, we've just kind of established that scanners can do a few things really, really well. And then there's a lot of things that are interesting that they really maybe can't do predictably. But really, the biggest thing that people are going to ask us, they don't even ask that question. It should be the first thing they ask. <laughs> but what they do ask is they just say, hey, guys, uh, how do I choose a scanner? Because I'm, I'm sure I want one. 
You know, I'm sure I want one. So which one is it? Now, the first question you should really be asking is what we tried to some answer in the beginning of the show is what are you going to use it for? So let's let's maybe go through. Well, what are the things that that, you know, most people think? So, Brad, somebody comes to you and they say, Brad, I know I want a scanner because I got money. (laughs) <laughs> burning a something. hole in my pocket yeah, I got to I saw this thing on Facebook I saw it I have to do it I must do it now and they say Brad all right so I want to buy a scanner um what are the what is it typically that they think that they're going to use their scanner for or why is the reason most people are investing in scanning uh, I think we answered it already but I, you'd have to ask yourself what do I do in my practice Okay, if you're a heavy implant practice and you're doing just tons and tons of implants and that's what you want to use it for, we kind of already answered that. Okay, maybe onesie, twosies, implants, maybe it's not for you. But if you really think the most dentists that are out there, you know, what is, you know, 80%, 70% of your business, Crown Bridge, single units? I mean, that's 80% of the crowns we get in are single unit quadrant dentistry, right? So ask yourself, what's your practice like? If you're a heavy denture practice, we already answered that, probably not for you. Okay, so you got to evaluate your practice individually, you know, what you do. And we already answered what you can use it for predictably. So if you're that quadrant dentistry and you're doing single implants, it's a great it's a great application for you. Yeah, it's a great. Now, I guess the other the other thing that is a next maybe the next question we want you to ask. So if you're looking at a scanner right now, we want you to first consider what you're going to use it for. Absolutely. That's number one. And make sure that it fits with your practice. Don't buy a scanner because you saw it on on Facebook. Buy a scanner because it fits with your practice. The second thing is, how much unpredictability are you willing to live with? In other words, you go back through this list we've created of all the things that are less predictable, and you say, well, man, if I do a lot of that stuff, say I'm doing, I say I'm a, a clear choice center, and I'm doing a ton of all on four, and that's my practice, and I wanna do it digital. Well, mm. how much unpredictability are you willing to how live much with? Slop. Right. <laughs> right. Because Brad's just sitting here telling us that that basically they the have only to way turn you can the do knob. Is to increase they have tolerance. to turn the knob from decrease like tolerance. good to like so so on their millings on their milling unit. And you know, that doesn't sit well with me. It may sit well with you. I think that you know, we, what, rather than having like a four-hour show on, on covering every single scanner, because we couldn't do that, it would have just we would have been here mm-hmm. all night. We we really I think need to try to sum up. I, I think, and, and you guys tell me if I'm wrong here, but I think that there's sort of two major groups of scanners out there. Well, okay? hang hang on, John. Before we go there, yeah. Before we go, yeah, there, yeah, yeah. I, I think you just made and developed a thought process of is a scanner right for me in my practice? Okay, so you look mm-hmm. through. I'm a 80% quadrant dentistry. I do implants, John. I'm a dentist. I'm, I'm, I want to buy one. The next thing before you even go there, I'd be asking, are you ready for it? Because oh. this is a paradigm shift in your practice. If you're going to buy a scanner thinking it's going to make you more efficient on the short run, you're wrong. It's going to slow you down. It's going to change your workflow. You need mm. to increase time in your impressioning appointments. It, you know, you know, 30 to 60 scans it's going to take you to just get this in your hand and be predictable. So think about back when you got out of dental school, how long did it take you to do your first amalgam or your first crown prep or your first impression? I relate it back to that. So you have to be mentally prepared to go through a paradigm shift in your practice and not only you, but your staff. If you don't have your staff on board for this paradigm shift, it will fail. I've seen more scanners get returned or dissatisfied purchasing when they get it in and they thought they were ready as a dentist, but their staff rejected it. Mm. Wow. So mental, mentally prepare you, prepare your staff. So now if you're past that point, everybody's on the same page, you're ready to buy right. a cool, cool <clears throat> new toy. Go ahead, John. Now you can yeah. take it. So. Well, that's a very good point, though, because we don't want to look over that. you know. And, we, and I think one way to help to figure that out is you need to go demo some stuff. You know, you need to go sit down with your team and you need to go through whether they bring it to your office, you go to, you know, a lot of times they'll have like these scanner rodeos where they'll bring in, you know, four or five different scanners and you get to play with them on real patients, not on a type it on, but on real patients like you or your team. And I think that will show you how hard it is 
versus how easy you thought it was going to be. And I think that's a great point, Brad. But let, so let's assume that you get you've you've demoed some some scanners, right? You've tried them out. You're like scanning's for me. My team's behind me. I'm committed to this. I know it's going to be a learning curve, but I'm committed. I think it's the way I kind of think about scanning today is that there's kind of two major groups. You've got your scanners that are more designed for quadrant dentistry, uh, single units. That's kind of their bread and butter, and and these are more basic in general. And what I mean by that is more basic, like less color, more powder, um, not necessarily the fastest scanners, but they're accurate. And then you've got scanners that are kind of advertised to be, you know, full arch, quote unquote, uh, is their forte. And I think that the two scanners that are in that area, at least the ones that advertise it the most, okay, are going to be Trios by 3Shape as well as Omnicam, Cerex Omnicam. Those are probably the two that have got the most bells and whistles. They've got the most fancy stuff. And then there's a lot of other scanners in the other in the other group. Now, you know, maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm being too categorical. But I think that in general we can say that there's you're going to pay a lot more for those two scanners versus the rest. I mean, is that is that a fair characterization of sort of the way that kind of the groups are of the scanners? Or do I you would, think that I that's would maybe say too? You were right on, John. I would totally okay. agree. Okay. So let, so let me let, let me let me oh, step ahead, in Wes. here for yeah. just a second. <clears throat> So basically what you're saying <clears throat> is that there is two categories. And so what that means is, is you've got to decide basically how much money you're going to spend. Right. Okay? Because and these what, ones that you're talking about. what do those two about, groups do for you? Yeah. Right. And what do those two? So we already talked about, when we talk about in general terms of predictability 100% of the time, every scanner can do these things 100% of the time. OK, right. unless right. it's just trash scanner. OK, but I'm telling you, of all, all the major the, brands, all though. the major brands are going to do the things we talked about previously, 100 percent of the time predictable. But the outer limits things, if you're one of the Tinker Toy guys and you want Limit to do a little bit more, maybe. And even with these, even with these more expensive scanners, it's just not 100 percent of the time. Because right. the types of scanning technology they're using is not that much different than the guys that are the lower cost scanners. So, the, you know, in, in case in point, I have to bring this up, is because they're not selling that. Guess what they're selling? If you go to Three Shapes website right now, okay, and you look at their top things that they're how they're advertising this for you in your practice, they're not saying do full arch. They're not saying right. scan multiple implants. You know what they're saying? Engage and excite your patients with trios. Give a great treatment experience. Get mm -hmm. more open options. Grow your practice. Did you hear anything in that sales pitch <laughs> that has anything to do with full arch? They're selling no, the experience I, to the patient. Th that's exactly you know, right. My case and in you point know, is, hold I, on, man, I get hold that. on. I get My that. case in point, this is no different than a Calajek that we talked about. If yeah. you want to have an experience for your patient, to them to go tell everybody, my doctor's impressionless. That's been going on, we already said, for more than 10 years, and the market penetration is only 10%. Okay? Right. And, and so the question I have, John, and you should answer it because you're the, you're the spreadsheet guy of the two of us. I like him too, but you're, you're the next level guy. Can scanners make you money? Yeah, I think that, and I, I have really, really done the math on this, and, and I think lots of people have, okay? And I think that most of those numbers would come out that you do save, of course, as everybody knows, you save a little bit each time you scan in terms of impression material and impression trays. You may save on some remakes of impressions. You may save a little bit of time in pouring models, you may save on some shipping costs. You may save from your laboratory, depending on how they structure things. Maybe you get a digital discount. Maybe you don't. You may save uh, in all of those ways, yes. So at what point does the savings of impression material, trays, all that stuff add up? Uh, it turns out that for me, the break-even point is around $15,000 for a scanner. 
Now, what I'm based that on is that, okay, let's say you amortize this thing out over five years. You're going to pay it off over five years, which is, I think, most equipment. So now you start to look at what you spend on impression material per year for the average office and, and impression trays and all that. You know, it's about 3000 bucks a year you're pay making payments on the scanner. You probably end up breaking even, maybe even make a little bit, uh, quote unquote, on that. Now, yeah, there's also the whole other thing Brad mentioned. It takes longer to take a full arch scan, especially at the beginning. So if you're doing a lot of full arch stuff, I would argue that you start to lose the potential money-making benefits. So I, I, I don't want to get into that. We don't need to spreadsheet this thing out too much other than to say, you know, do the numbers yourself. I think you're going to find there's not a huge amount of money that you're going to make on scanning if you're spending more than about 15 grand. But that's not really why most people get into scanning. That's the right. question is, is it worth spending $40,000? That's is right. Is it worth spending $30,000? We're not just at, talking well, a one-time fee here. You know, we're talking right. about service calls and things right. like software going down and things that have right. to be paid for over time. Yeah, and there's a monthly fee for, for most right. of these scanners. There's monthly a monthly or fee. an not, annual subscription, one of the two. That's right. Yep. You're going to have yep. that in every software. You're never going to get rid of that. Now, some of these scanners that they're coming out with now, these lower cost scanners, you pay it once and you're done. Even yep. though, and that's the future. Yeah, that's but probably yeah, the well, yeah, I, you know, but where guys, I'm not sure the ROI on that for them. How long will that sustainable? We just talked about I development agree. stopped on these scanners. Well, if the development stopped because the revenue stores had stopped, how do you do a one-time sell for a scanner with no support point. program? Where do they come up with money to develop? It's a great well, point. I think that's where yeah. the cost is going to be. There, there does come a point where I think it's going to make sense, and this is another show, but I think there comes a point where there, it does make sense from a standpoint of saying, okay, we're going to uh, develop a scanner that costs $5,000, okay? Now, at this point, uh, this is something that's going to wear out after two, three years. It's going to break. Now, this is an iPhone, okay? And now you're saying it's incremental differences and people are paying a premium for it, and they're doing it on a monthly basis, and you're upgrading it just like an iPhone, just like Verizon sells you a phone, and you pay a monthly fee, and you get a new one every couple of years, but it can't be $40,000. No, exactly. You know, it no, doesn't let me, make let me, any sense. Let me say this. Uh, let me move on to the next point, and because yeah. we could go on, again, about the money thing of this forever. John, before you answer, and I have my reasons for us not answering first because I do want us to answer, but Brad, as a global view does a scanner make a better dentist? You know, I think it brings awareness to you as a dentist. Um, I want to—I'll just say yes. I think it makes you a better dentist. Why do I think it makes you a better dentist? Is because when you scan that prep and it's zoomed up in front of you and you can three-dimensionally spin around and look at your margin or lack of seeing your margin, and you look at the sharpness of your prep three-dimensionally or maybe how tapered the prep is, you know, a 20-degree, 25-degree taper of the prep, those things bring awareness to you as a dentist. Now, what you do with that information is up to you. But I think if you pay attention it, it's easier to evaluate the quality of your product through a scanner than it is to look into an impression where you can't really see that type of detail. So right. I think it makes you a better dentist if you pay attention and you apply that information back to the next does prep. That does that bear out in your remake rates? Do you have fewer remakes? It does. With, with it scanning? does. And it's interesting because every time I get a new scanner, I get the call after training going, Brad, I just got a scanner. Can you watch over my preps? I want to know how I'm doing. I want to know what to do. And I don't just look at, did it give me the information? I'm looking at how short is the prep, the sharp line angles. You know, is there severe excavation done? Did you need to do a build up on it? How tapered are the preps? So it's an opportunity you know, for you to give them a, feedback. Absolutely. And every doctor I work with, they love it. They're like, oh, wow, that's cool. I, I'm going to change my prep. And hey, that's why my crowns keep coming off is because it's a short prep and it's tapered walls, <laughs> you know? So I use right. it as an opportunity and they use it as an opportunity to make themselves better. So I do truly think the doctors are buying them for those two reasons. Number so one, they, they, they okay. want to be a better dentist and they want to push themselves to digital because it is <laughs> a futuristic thing. And number two, I think they want the cool factor to the patients. They want their patients mm -hmm. talking about it. I think now, the if problem you, with that the problem with that is that this is a self-fulfilling prophecy because the ones that want to be better 
by the scanners and therefore they're better but it wasn't because of the scanner it was because they wanted to be better yeah so the and, and you know that's why we have the show because what we believe is that the ones that want to be better are going to be better yes you know our yeah. our challenge is really to the ones that want to be better we're trying to give you a way to become better through listening to stuff like what we do <clears throat> but it's more to the ones who are mediocre who know that they're maybe mediocre they're like man I know I'm not doing as good as I need to. What I think that we're hearing from Brad, here's a lab technician who's saying, hey, look, you want to get better. Like, this is a technology that if you sit down with me, you show me your preps at 20X on a scanner, and you are willing to be open for a lab technician to give you good, honest feedback, they can help you to be better at your game. And I mean, to me, that's where this technology has a huge upside yeah, i will tell you one thing straight up that if you're a dentist that doesn't pack a two chord technique <laughs> okay don't buy a scanner Say because because yes. <laughs> you're gonna need uh -oh. to do a two chord technique unless uh -oh. unless you prep above the tissue you know if you right. if you raise your margin above tissue you don't have to worry about the tissue right. you're fine you're good with a scanner but if you're if you're prepping and chasing carries and you're going a, a millimeter or a two or three or more below the tissue, you have got to push the tissue out of the way um, and let the camera see it. You know, hey, so heck, they're not even right doing to... it for impression material because fifty percent right. of impressions received in the lab have tissue over the margin. Yeah, so could could be another limitation of why we only have ten percent penetration. That's you know, exactly the see, that's where I was going with that is people don't want people, <laughs> people don't, don't want to see, see it because yeah. they already yeah. know it's bad. <laughs> they so they're like, well, I don't want to see bad. I don't want to see bad at Can 20x. I'd rather the see it. Like that yeah, they're not terrible. losing loops anyway, so they don't want to see it at 20x. They're <laughs> like, not even using 2.5x. They just let the assistant scan. Scan it for me. Scan the final Just press. scan I'm it. Don't show it to me. Just don't <laughs> show it to me. Listen, Just send it to Brad. He'll figure it out in the lab. Stick with impressions, people. Yeah. <laughs> and one more thing. So I just, I, I got to add oh, one yeah. more thing, Jen. You're talking about, you know, you're making selection of a scanner or what to buy. I would, yeah. I would go back and make sure that you understand a complete workflow of that unit. You know, where does that file go to? Does it go directly to the lab so the patient could be sitting in a chair for evaluation? Or is it two, three, four hours, 24 hours later that it gets to the lab? Just understand the workflow um, and expectations. The other thing I'd really look at is support of the system. Um, there's a lot of drop and goes out there. You know, they, they drop the system, they give you one day training, you pay $3,000 for one day, they walk out and you're done. It's true. And, and I'm cleaning up that mess with the doctors. And I don't think that's fair. And I think that's some not. of the reasons that there's failures out there of these units being put in is because the doctors are not thoroughly being trained. The, the seller of the unit isn't being held accountable to do thorough training. And so the doctors good. just kind of hung out to dry, you know. So who's doing a good job? You know, yeah, just call them out. Who's doing a good job? 3M has done a really good job on the training support side of things for me. Um, they're there. They're there for reoccurring training. Uh, I think they do a great job training. They've been in the market for a long time. Um, they stand out to me for sure. You know, 3M is um, not a sponsor. Not nope, a sponsor. No, they're not they a sponsor. Not a sponsor. They, they, they didn't pay me to say it either. I'm just telling hey, listen, you what, I'm gonna, what I see. I think we need to go right into it. Okay, John. What? Yeah, I think they can. Well, go ahead. <laughs> well, go ahead. Well, I'm just gonna say. I'm like, you know, all this time we're like slamming scanners. Well, because I think the conclusion is we should stick with impressions. Well, that is it that is that the key? I mean, we've just said you can only do basically four or five things predictably. It doesn't really return on investment unless you buy a relatively inexpensive really, scanner. Really, you just need You're to learn how to pack using cord it for at least the first prep. 60 60 scans. We painted a pretty you're, bad picture here, didn't we? You're, we did. You've <laughs> got to either do two core technique or buy a laser or buy an electrosurge or whatever. I'm sorry, um, Alan Mead. Alan Mead, if you're listening to this right now, and I told you to buy something, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and then you start, and then you start thinking about the fact that technology's reached a plateau. Uh, it's got low market penetration. I mean, I'm hearing all this stuff. I think San I think scanners kind of suck. Scanners suck. <laughs> I mean, honestly, <laughs> that what being said, I mean, that being said, uh, Wes, how long have you been scanning? John, I've been scanning every day since 2009. <laughs> 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 oh man, I started scanning in dental school, John, and uh, really didn't pick it back up until I don't know until I talked to Brad, the dental lab guy, and and he sent down. Uh, 3M. So Again, when did you get your first uh, scanning unit? 2000 and 2009. What? 2009. So if you have been scanning for longer than Wes, 
I want you to send us a message on Facebook and I've been prove scanning it. nine years. I want you, I want a picture of you with your scanner that's got some kind yep. of identification of the date. <laughs> I'll tell you okay? what, when this that, episode that, goes that up, I'll take be, a selfie with my true date. <laughs> yeah, that could be like an old, you know, like Nokia phone, or that could be, you know, like the first Taylor Swift album. Dude, or, if you do that, you know, we'll, something send you in the background we'll send you a dental guy shirt. That, we'll send you a dental guy shirt if you do that. That would be so cool. Yeah. If you can yep. prove that you were scanning before West. Now, I don't mean Cerex, so just get out of here with that Cerex stuff. We're not talking <clears> about Cerex. But I'm right. talking about if you had a COS before Wes, <laughs> yep. bring it. So that being Brad, said, who, you know, well, would you I guys mean, do it again? You guys just said scanners. This whole episode did well, didn't work well. Would you well, do John, it again? John. Hold on. Now, everybody, now, as, keep, you... as the show has matured like a fine wine <laughs> <laughs> over the last couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. As the show's matured like a fine wine, <laughs> people have started calling me the old person they on have. the show. Now, <laughs> I will have you know Wes is older than I am, which really chaps me Thanks because it's like, come out. on. But I but use Botox. They, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jeez. That's like, oh, my gosh. Oh, so they've started calling me the old person because... I'm always the one like arguing for like the old way of doing things or like let's because Wes is like blazing the trail. No, I mean, you started blind. scanning in freaking 2009. You people didn't even like you hadn't even gone to dental school yet by that time. So I, I you know, you'd think, right, that I'm probably the guy with impressions. And, you know, you would be right up until about uh, two years ago. So I watched Wes scan and I watched him scan and I watched him scan and I watched him scan and he's all talking about the scanning, the scanning. And then T-Bone, we saw him at Voices Dentistry. He's like, why aren't you scanning? Why it makes you a better dentist? Why aren't you scanning? You know how he is. He really berated me. So I was like, okay. Man, he did. I'm going to look at this. I'm going to look at this. And so I got a TrueDef, a 3M True Definition scanner. And for the last couple of years, I've been scanning. And I'll tell you, I would never go back. I would never go back. Really? You know I mean? You've and never said that to me. <clears throat> now, you've never said that to me. Yeah. This is your honest Now, opinion. I will tell you, and this, and again, I don't want to go into a whole show about how I use scanning or you because it would no. take too long. Right. But I will tell you that I don't do a lot of full arch scanning, okay, no. because it's annoying. Neither do I. It's right. annoying, all right? But I will say that that's not where the ROI is. That's not where the fun is for me in scanning. It's using it for the day-to-day dentistry that I do with crown and bridge with single implant all the things we said is predictable I love the predictable stuff and for me and again are you we are seeing not a difference though because by, you're a good impressioner you know are you uh, seeing a you difference? know I'll be I'll be honest with you I saw a slight improvement in occlusion maybe I saw I, I it early I, as a lot of people do I had issues with contacts because it's just dialing it in okay so I initially I was like nah it's not like a whole lot different or necessarily better. I would say that I'm getting a great product. I would say that it, it has made me more critical on my preps in a good way. Um, I'm The thing that I, that I see about it now, though, is how efficient I can be. Like I can take a quadrant scan in 40 seconds yeah. and be done. And I'm done. And yeah. it's great. And there is a good ROI. There is a good patient experience. Now, I wouldn't spend $40,000 for that. I'll just tell you right up. So, I Brad, wouldn't. Brad, now that we've heard John's uh, confession, <laughs> Brad, how long have you been scanning? I mean, how, how long have you been scanning? Yeah. Great question. Uh, man, I was part of the whole 3M when they started launching um, kind of their development and so many meetings of how this is going to go. And I watched that all epically fail because they thought the whole world was going digital in like five years. But I've been doing it a long mm-hmm. time, guys. Um, we accept every scan that's uh, that or every scanner that's on the market. Uh, we got the printing machines to print the, the models out and, and do the workflow, oh uh, whether it's Crown or Bridge or... Uh, the implant side of things. So we, we've invested a lot in going digital. So, you know, if you ask me, I'm a big believer in digital. Everything we talked about does paint a true picture, but those doctors who are, have the right mindset and they do 80% single quadrant, you know, single unit dentistry, um, we love it. The doctors who have switched to love it. And I have very few that have bought a scanner and said, I wish I would have never. 
the guys who do are the ones who realize it right away within that first two to three months and they're done with it. It's just because they weren't ready for it. The guys who go through the learning curve and get down to that 40 second to a one minute scan for a quadrant, they love it. We're showing 0.5% remake factor, you know, which Whoa. is less than an average. Average in the lab is, you know, three to 5% uh, for a regular crown and bridge. So we see less remakes because of that. Uh, we offer a discount too, you know, coming in a lab, a digital discount because it saves us on incoming shipping. So we offer a discount back. Um, also, labor, gentlemen. I mean, what is what are we at? Three percent labor force in the United States right now. We're at all time low. You know, finding people to work anymore is getting to be an issue. So digital, you know, helps us maximize workflow with less people because we're able to set accept scans, digitally mark margins, and print models with less labor force too. I think there's somewhat that I think you're going to see that driving this a little bit here on the lab side in the next few years too. So I think that, you know, one of the things that's missing oftentimes in the discussion is, and I'm kind of close with this, is having a perspective in these discussions about digital from someone who's been doing it long enough to see the progression over time. You know, Brad was one of the first people, <clears throat> my understanding, and I think you're, I think you've correct me if I'm wrong on this, Brad, to be in even the milling business, you know, forget about scanning, just in milling and lava was a big part of your lab and getting that rolling back in the day when only a few milling centers were out there back when milling was really in its infancy. So somebody like Brad has seen milling from impressions, lab impression scanning, digitizing of impressions. He's seen how that's changed. He's seen how intraoral scanning's changed. He's seen how CEREC has changed. You know, that's the kind of perspective that you need when you're making a decision about a scanner, not just, you know, seeing some cool stuff. And I think that, you know, yes, you know, you might say to, about this show today, guys, you might say, well, you didn't really get into the brands and you didn't really get into, you know, the features and you didn't really get, and you know, we're just going to say like, we all agree there's just not that much difference in terms of what it can do. They all work. Right. Okay. They all work they good. They all work. The, it's, the it, data it's, coming out is great data, you know, yeah. no matter what so unit. make... So make the decision with your laboratory, I think is a good takeaway message with from this, is make a decision with your laboratory based upon things like support, uh, quality of, of the, the representation, the training, um, what your team can use the most easily. And as Brad said, most important thing is what fits your practice? You know, is That's this right. a fit for your practice? And But if it is, you know, also you got to run ROI on it. You and have you to. have to make sure that, you know, you can, this is a good money decision as well, because I don't think it always is. And I'm looking forward to the time when we don't have to think about the ROIs being the number one thing. I think we're getting closer to that. There's some new stuff coming out. We're just talking about this new Medit scanner that just got released. And maybe that could be an interesting disruption in the market. But, you know, Brad, I'll let you have the closing word and then we'll close out the show. You know, watch those units coming out in the market. There's a bunch of new ones. I mean, Condor, we've been watching for four years now. Condor is another one. I haven't really seen it hit the marketplace real heavy yet. But it's kind of, I don't you know, know where that's at. So some of this new development, they come in, just be careful. Don't get burned on it. You know, um, it's cool to watch. But, you know, leading edge or bleeding edge, you're going to be on one of the two, you know. Um, but look at your companies and make sure you're investing in something that's going to be around for a while. That would be my suggestion. So, and well, <clears throat> go ahead. Believe Sorry. in the technology. You know, once you get that technology, believe in it because it, it's good. It, it works. It's good. And, and I do believe it is the wave of the future for sure. It's going to get better and better. It's going to get better and better. And I, you heard me say in the beginning, I said it for a reason. I don't think things are going to change much in the next five to 10 years and what they can do for us. Um, I think the software is probably going to be. The thing that we see change the most, and it has been the thing that's been innovated on the most, Brad will speak to that. I think the next episode, we're going to talk probably about the most exciting thing when it mm -hmm. comes to getting this data and being able to do something with it in the analog world. The piece that is changing the most is how we utilize the STL file to print things. 
And then the next episode, we're going to be covering that. So listen, I want to thank Brad for being on the show. It's always and a pleasure, if, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. And listen, if if you're listening to this right now and you've got questions, or if you've been scanning longer than me, uh, since <laughs> if you've been scanning before 2009, you need to send me a picture with you know of your, your scanner um, and uh, take a selfie, post it on our Facebook, hit us up on Twitter. Um, we are always looking for your comments and suggestions about what we need to be bringing to the table. John and I are super excited about some of these upcoming episodes. We have some great things planned for this coming fall. Season four of The Dental Guys is Whoa. approaching very soon. Yes, I said it, John. Season Crazy. four is approaching very soon. And so for Brad, for John, I'm Wes, and we are The Dental Guys.